the ones you're going to want it goes down that list. So, how many of you guys have heard of the bottom seven commitment sheet? Anyone? How about Jessica Lynch? Have you all heard of her? I know it's been almost 20 years ago now, but the Bible Sevens main shoot was her unit. She was one of the first female POWs, probably the first one in the uh, Iraq War. And the Bible Sevens main shoot was basically, uh, you know, a service and support unit of some type. I don't know what they were supposed to maintain because they never got the chance. But they got lost on the early fight, ended up pushing the bad guy, and then they got ambushed. And most of them got killed or captured. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about that unit that you should know. The first one is, the most important one really is, that every weapon in the, in the unit, every rifle, pistol, crucial weapon, malfunctioned whenever they were in combat. Every single one. Now, why do you suppose that happened? Right? What was going wrong in that unit where nobody's weapon worked? Not just one or two. Everybody, every weapon failed, right? So we know obviously they weren't doing weapons maintenance. But that unit had the records and number of leaders, didn't it? It had a company commander, it had an executive officer, it had the two leaders, it had a first sergeant, it had the two sergeants, it had squad leaders. It had all those people, and none of them, not even one of that entire group of leaders made their soldiers maintain their weapons. So what that tells us, there's something wrong in that culture. And what was it that was wrong in that culture that led their soldiers to get wiped out, basically? Well, that is that they didn't think they were the ones who were going to have to do the fighting. The army in that era was bifurcated between what we called combat MOSs and non-combat MOSs. And that bifurcation is creeping back in as we get farther and farther away from the part of, the, of history where the whole army was involved, involved in combat. We weren't hearing people talking about that in 2005 because we realized it was a terrible idea. We realized mostly because a bunch of soldiers got killed because of the stupid idea. You can almost see the five seven major, whatever it was they were supposed to maintain, going out to their field problems prior to the war, right? Driving out there in their trucks, setting up their tents, practicing doing maintenance on whatever it is they were supposed to maintain in a field environment. Probably didn't have anybody pulling security, definitely weren't worried about how they were going to fight if their convoy got ambushed on the way out to their location. Probably had like one person awake at night to make sure nothing got stolen. Because their assumption was that other people would do the fighting. Now that is a pretty profound mistake, considering what it cost them. Why well, it's a mistake that's creeping back into our army again. Think about this for a second. How many of your peers came here because they could get free education, and they're thinking they'll do their time with their army, and look, I'm not telling you how to pass that, but they're just hoping and adoring that they'll be in the army. Because they think they're going to be in some portion where they're not going to have to do the fighting. So let's consider those portions for a second. What portions of the army do you think are farthest away from the ones who might have to do the fighting? I mean, other than a maintenance unit. What about like cyber, right? Or space command or something like that. Sounds pretty far removed. But consider this. Did you know that there's a movement afoot in the Army to make cyber a combat MOS? As it designated as a combat MOS. So why would that be? Imagine if we were fighting in an enemy city right now. How would the enemy be communicating with each other? It'd be on the internet, wouldn't it? The days of radios and such are mostly gone. So it would be on the internet. That means your cyber commandos are going to be in with your infantry battalion in that fight. Even the Space Command guys, right? Guess what Space Command does? Among other things, it does stuff like jam GPSs, right? How strong do you think the strength is on a GPS thing? So that's their kind of stuff. So you know what they do that everybody else wearing that green suit does? They move around the battlefield. 
But what do you think happens when that cyber guy and the space commando are in the back of that truck and the lead vehicle in the convoy gets blown off the map? Everybody burned alive. Back vehicle gets hemmed in. Now what? Now they unass that vehicle, take down that closest building because they are provisional instruments. So now, with that being said, let's talk a little bit more about the battle specifically. Once upon a time, we had the chief of staff of the Army and Sergeant Major of the Army coming to the gym. This is now the Army Combatant School, before it was even officially the Army Combatant School. And they had their big entourage with them, so imagine how many people that was. Probably like 30 people or something. Basically, a two size elf. So we asked the group, we're like, okay, who's the best runner in this organization? And everybody knew. Well, they're like, oh yeah, it's Major Ronald, I just won the Marine Corps Marathon, or whatever. You know? We're like, cool, that's good, man, it's good to be a good runner. Who's the best shot? And crickets, right? Nobody had a clue who the best shot was. I said, okay, well, who's the best fighter? Once again, nobody had any idea. So I said, what you're telling me is that this organization has selected running as more important than shooting and fighting. And that's good if we're going to run from the enemy, right? But if we're going to run towards the enemy, the shooting and fighting are going to get more important with every step. Now, why do you suppose it is that they selected running as more important than shooting and fighting? It didn't happen like they had a committee meeting, right? And they took a vote, and like seven people voted for running, three for shooting, and one guy who wrestled in high school voted for fighting. That's not how it played out at all, was it? So why do they value running over shooting and fighting? Well, because they, like almost every unit in the Army, every morning falls out, like phase four march, takes off on a run, right? And what happens about a mile into that run? The first person starts to drop in the back. What do we all think of that person? In fact, standing here talking, I know that I don't even have to mention what we think of that person because we all think the same thing. Everybody doesn't want to be that person, right? In fact, even that turd wishes some other turd would fall out because they know what everybody thinks of them too. So what's going on there, whether you realize it or not, is that that run is more than just a PT session. It is an informal competition. And informal competitions have a social aspect. And that is they carry with them the threat of public humiliation. So just so we're all tracking, right, you, as the leaders of the Army to be, must be a good enough runner to not be publicly humiliated when you take your platoon or your company or your division out on a run. You must. It's demanded. The culture demands it of you. Okay? So that's not the only aspect of an informal competition. The other aspect is that it has to come as an accolade. So imagine another mile into that run. And the leader says, all right, relief. Everybody makes back to the company area. We all see the rabbits take off, right? And everybody wishes they were one of those rabbits. Maybe not enough to do the PT to be one of those rabbits, but you get the idea, right? We all wish we were better runners, and we're all afraid to be a shitty runner. Because the informal competition of going on that unit run pushes that into us. That's why we value running in the Army. Because we do it collectively like that, right? So with that being said, let's think for a second about marksmanship. Why did that unit value marksmanship? Well, last time you went to the range, who knew how you did? Most of the time it's you, the person who helped you figure with the score, and then the clerk. And then the only thing that gets reported up the chain is like, what percentage pass. So imagine if instead, when you came back from the range, we published the scores. And there they were, on the wall in your company area. What would happen? Well, we know exactly what would happen because people are not too hard to figure out. Everybody would walk up to the list and they'd look at the bottom and they would say, Larson, you shot a 14. Why do we even give you a rifle, right? We should make you carry heavy things 
for the people who can shoot. In other words, the smack talking would begin. Now imagine if you also gave some sort of accolades to the person who was the best shot, or the people who were the best shot. Then what would happen next time you went to the range? Well, the training would be that much more serious, wouldn't it? Because everybody would know that competition element drives the values of that organization. Everybody going to the range under that informal competition regimen would be trying to do better. Because there's more than just, did I pass? Everybody get the idea, right? So what about with fighting? How do we make a value fighting? Well, I'll give you a sort of Neanderthal version, the way we started this in the beginning. And I'll come back later and tell you methods you could do in your organization. But in the first, early days of combatants, back in second range of the way we did it was, we had the time uh, formation on payday, right? So this is the old days, we didn't have the internet. So we had a formation, we all got our check, and then we got the day off so we could go cash it and pay our bills, right? Because you had to run around town and pay your bills. That's how it was. So that being said, at that formation, the way it would happen is, the battalion sergeant major would get up on the podium and call out two people who ran. Be like, give me the first squad leader, first platoon half company, and the third squad leader, third platoon charter company. Those two guys would fall out in front of the battalion, and then we'd have a fight. I want you to think about how that affects the organization. So imagine this. Over in Africa, I mean, there's this guy, right? This is the proverbial, I would just shoot you guy. First, I would like to make note that we are making fun of this person, right? Because we actually know what he's all about. And this is why we know. Because that guy gets called out by the sergeant major, right? And then he runs out in front of the tired, and then somebody who is not that guy twists him up like they're closing the bread with him, or like he's a piece of paper they're finished with or something. And then he's got to run back and take charge of his squad again, or his platoon, or his company. When General Milley, everybody know who General Milley is, General Joint Chief? When he was in charge of the uh, of three corps, he had the uh, brigade commanders and brigade sergeants major fight each other in the cage, but using only grappling rules, at their core combatants championships. So let's think about the awesomeness of that for a second. And go back to that squad leader, right? The exact same circumstance. What happens to that squad leader gets twisted up like that? If everybody knows what this is about. That's what happens to it. So how many times do you think that has to happen? Because what's really happened in that unit is, it is no longer socially acceptable to be a smack talking pansy, right? You've got to be able to back your stuff up in a unit that has that. You've got to be somebody, just like on that run, right? What are your soldiers expecting you when you go out of that run? If you fall out, they all lose respect for you, right? If you're totally smoked when you get to the end, you're okay. What they really expect of you is at the end of that run, you're with the platoon, and you're still formidable. In other words, you're fit enough to make that run and be formidable when you get there, right? That's what they expect. So the good news about that squad leader that gets humiliated like that is, he can redeem himself. All he's got to do is come back another time and start tearing people up, and everybody gains respect for him again, right? It really is that simple. Because in that unit, you must. Everybody get the idea? Okay, so that's called an informal competition. Now we are doing that all the time, right? What do you think that day one when we started doing competitive public? What was that about? It was that as well, wasn't it? it turns out, every time that we're grabbing, every single time, it's a competition. Every single time, what you're doing is not only learning, but you're establishing yourself. Establishing yourself as somebody to be reckoned with. And that's a very important thing, isn't it? Think about that for a second. We want the sort of army where people must be somebody to be reckoned with, 
Do we respect it? Or do we want the sort of army where you don't need that? Like it's a pretty simple concept, isn't it? So that's the feature of informal competitions that's most important. Now there are other kinds of competitions. For example, this institution, we are the champions of formal competitions, right? We have competitions for everything around here. We have everything from the Brigade Boxing Open and Sandhurst to the Spelling Bee, man. We got all kinds of competitions, right? So what do those competitions do for us? Why do you suppose we have them around here? Well, we have them because formal competitions, well, let's bring back up a second and put it in this way. Anybody in this room fight the Brigade Boxing Open last time? Okay, so let's just imagine you have somebody in the room that fought in the Brigade Boxing Championship. What did they get out? What they got out of it was motivation, right? They were already self-motivated to train, but having a championship gave them a reason to train harder, right? It gave them a reason to approach excellence or to attempt excellence. So I'll just give you an example of how that would work. Imagine that all of us were just people who liked running, right? And every day we'd run into each other down by the river just running. And we'd be like, hey, what's up? You know, we're running. Hey, how you doing? And we're having friendly, like, running, you know, group down there. What would happen if somebody said, hey, it's going to be running group. Let's have a championship and see who's the best. Well, the self-motivated people would be motivated to try harder and approach excellence. And we would have had better some people who were much better run than we would if we didn't have that competition. Everybody get the idea? And that's the way formal competitions work. They spur on excellence. They make some people excellent. Some people who are self-motivated. Now, what does that do for us as a unit? So, for example, what did you get out of the brigade boxing over last year? You got trained? Did you train up for it? You did? Well, you're the competitor I was talking about. There you go. What about you? You got entertained out of it. Not so. You did get something out of it, right? But it wasn't training, was it? You got training. You didn't get training, right? Because you were not the person who thought, who thought that was a thing. It's not any different than the spelling bee, right? Unless you picked out the box and things for, for a reason, right? The people who are self-motivated get a lot out of it. The people who are not get virtually nothing out of it. What they do get is a little entertainment. They also get some experts within their ranks. So imagine this, for example. When the best units in the world want to become better marksmen, who do they hire to teach them to shoot better? Well, they hire the best of being competitive shooters. They hire guys like Rob Blazer and Jerry Byrne and those people. If you don't know who they are, that's what the, they used to be, some of the top shooters in the world. Hired by the most elite units. And they know nothing about tactics. And they know nothing about how you would employ the shooting skill. But because they fought themselves to be the best people in the whole world, they know a whole lot about how you would train on that skill, right? So that's what we hire those guys. One thing we get out of having formal championships is some people aspire towards excellence. That's a great thing. Another thing we get is then we have some experts within our ranks. Okay? But just imagine the measure of success of a combatant program or a boxing program or whatever program that we're talking about that meets the needs of the battle, right? What's the measure of success? Imagine you have an infantry company, right? 150 soldiers roughly, and you trained eight of those people to be the combat equivalent of UFC champions. You knew no matter what happened on the battlefield, they could outshoot everybody and they could beat your, beat your tail. What are the odds that they would be the one engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Yeah, so there's 150 people in a freaking infantry uh, company roughly. You have 10 of those guys, the X would be one at 15, right? Not the range. So in other words, that would not be a successful unit, would it? Wouldn't be a successful program. Because the measure of success is not what level of excellence we can get a few people to. This is an army. We have a million people. We have a million people, any one of whom could be Jessica Lynch. What do you think the odds are if you had to pick out somebody from the whole army, there's probably 500,000 people deployed at that time, 
How many of you would have picked Jessica Lynch out as the one who needed the skill set out of those 500,000? Random, right? So the measure of success of the combatant program is the ability of every soldier, or the average soldier, right? I'll tell you a story about it. Once upon a time, I hired this guy with a great black belt of jiu-jitsu, MMA fighter, had a master's degree in physical education, to train the third infantry division. Built a gym underneath them, taught him the curriculum, said, hey, here's a bunch of soldiers to work for you as your assistant instructors. I'll be back in six months to expect. Came back in six months, had a big gym, you know, it's like two basketball courts on. And he had 100 people on their train. I was like, oh, this kick ass goes well. I said, so let's go inspect the division. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, we hired you to train a division. 20,000 soldiers in the division. 100 people on this map. So that's 100 out of 20,000. Not a very big percentage. So let's go look at the rest of the division. We drove around for three days. Pulling soldiers out of red, how to do it, except where we didn't find a single soldier that knew a single thing that he was supposed to be teaching that division. Because his expertise was training self-motivated people, right? Same as if we were having that, cha that championship competition. No small number of people were getting very good. And it doesn't matter. You see my point, right? Okay, so that's an important thing to note about formal competitions. Informal competitions have this, there's another feature of competitions that's important to know. And that is that once you start putting competitions on people, they start training to win them. This is slightly different than training to win real fights, isn't it? So for example, in wrestling, what's the defense of the guillotine choke? What's that? In other words, there isn't one. <laughs> You pin the guy who's got you in the guillotine choke in the Olympics, you win by pin. Because he's not allowed to choke you out. How about in boxing? What's the defense to the front teeth? What is the one? You can't kick people in boxing. How about in judo? What's the defense to the jab? What is the one? In judo, you can't do the jab, right? So why don't boxers know how to defend the teeth? Wrestlers not defended their guilty and choking. Why not? Because they're not training to win fights. They're training to win competitions that have their own rules that are slightly different than real fighting, right? Imagine, is the UFC a real fight? It's not a real fight. See anybody's buddy jump in? Anybody bite anybody's nose off? Anybody kick the other guy to jump? And real fights, that stuff happens. They're fighting there with like a gentleman's agreement not to bite each other's nose off. Nobody's buddies jumping in. We're going to obey by these rules. So it's not a real fight, right? So those guys are operating within a more expanded set of rules than wrestling and boxing and Muay Thai and etc. But still a set of rules that are not the rules of engagement on the battlefield, right? Everybody get the idea? So, how does this play out? Well, I'll tell you something. When we first came back from the invasion of uh, Panama, when I was the first training in Panama many years ago, that's in 89, um, we realized that we didn't know much about close quarters battle. So think about that. When was the last time before that, before 1989, that U.S. forces in large numbers were engaged in, uh, in fighting the built-up areas? Probably the previous time was like, you know, the Battle of Way in 68, or before that was probably when the U.S. forces were fighting in Seoul in the second year of the Korean War. Like it wasn't really an expertise. I mean, you know, most of our army bases are all in the woods anyway. They're out there training in the forest all the time. So we didn't know much about it. We got down there and we realized, holy shit, we got a lot to learn. So I was one of the people lucky enough that they sent me around to go uh, learned some other stuff. One of the things that I learned was the method of close quarters marksmanship that we use today in the Army, which for the record all came from civilian competition. How many of you guys have ever been on a stress shoot before? A couple of people. It's basically the idea in these kind of competitions is you have a major league gunfight. So for example, I could be at a, I could be a, a clerk at a 7-Eleven. 
I'm moving my pistols in the top drawer. And now the target array in front of me to represent the bad guys. The dude standing behind me with a timer that can hear my shot. So when he says, are you ready? And he takes the timer off, I engage my weapon, shoot all the targets, right? Then it added points up that I scored on those targets, and divided by the time. So therefore I get a hit factor of how much, uh, how many points that was scored per second. Kind of get the idea on the map there. Okay, so that means that speed and accuracy count equals the way they do it, similar to the way they do in real gunfire. Get the idea. Okay? So that's what we do with stress shoots in the arm. Came from those civilian competitions. So when I learned that, I brought it back to first grade retail. We started a club on Sundays. We called the Sunday Night Slaughter. Every day, every Sunday after we went to church, we'd all get together and practice killing people, right? So with that being said, after a while, we were getting pretty good at it. So we thought, hey, man, we'll go fight in these civilian tournaments, right? So that's what we did. We started winning, we started entering civilian competitions. And as soon as we got there, we realized how different we were than the other competitors. Because the deal with us was, we were all combat vets, and we were all training, doing this as training for combat, right? So we kept that in mind all the time in what we were doing. Well, what were the civilians we were competing against for, training for? Victory in the competitions, right? So they had let all this non-tactical stuff drift into the way they did it. For example, imagine I had like a piece of cover here and I had to gauge target behind it, and then I had to move over to another piece of cover and gauge target behind it. But then when I got to this one is where I was running out of bullets on my weapon, right? So I had to change mags. So those guys would change mags while they were running the next piece of cover, right? Because it's faster. Even though it's not really that tactically sound. You get the idea, right? So it's an inevitable consequence of competitions that people will train to win rather than train for the battlefield. Now the difference between us and that club, Sunday Night Slaughter, and the people we're shooting against is the difference you have to keep in mind as the leaders of the army when you get out there, right? Competitions are a wonderful tool, all the reasons we just talked about. But they have this inherent weakness that they will drift you off asthma. You know what happens when you're off azimuth for 100 meters, for 1,000 meters, for 10,000 meters, right? Pretty soon you're way off the mark. Next thing you know, you got a grappling contest where nobody can choke each other. Or you've got a striking match where you can't tackle each other. Or something like that, right? Pretty far off. So that being said, what kept us in that shooting club on azimuth was that we were focused on the battlefield, right? So that's us. We have to be the ones focused on the battlefield, understanding the effects of competition, how they work for us as a wonderful tool to spread competence across the organization, right? Remember, that's the benefit of, of uh, uh, informal competition, is that they spread competence around the organization. And the benefit of formal competition is they drive excellence, right? Everybody try to get the idea. Now this, this plays out over the history of the Army as well. So believe it or not, the Army has had combatant doctrine for a really long time. The very first combatant manual published in the U.S. Army was published in 1852. It was a translation of a French bayonet fighting manual by Captain George McClellan, right? So that's how long ago we've had, we've had doctrine. And it was a competitive system. And that competitive system of bayonet fencing not only was the style of hand-to-hand -hand combat taught in every European style army all the way until World War I, it was in the Olympics until 1936. Up until the 36th Olympics, uh, fencing was foil, FD, saber, and bayonet. Right? So my point is, it was a competitive system and it was a skill-based system. So it died in the army in World War I. So why did it die? Well, there's two reasons that you should probably understand. The first one is it didn't meet the needs of the battlefield. Remember that drift we were talking about, right? What happens on the fencing strip? Pretty soon, it's pretty far away from what's going on on the battlefield, right? So what happened on the fencing strip? That's why we had big long rifles at that point, right? And at that point, for a while, we had two and a half foot long sword bayonet in our inventory. Because on the fencing strip, a longer weapon is an advantage, right? So then the soldiers took those long rifles and everything to war. Now you're in a confined trench, right? So what's that? It's like a seven foot long pipe that you got one shot out of. So the soldiers figured out right away that wasn't the best method. 
Better to go with a bag full of frags and a shovel, right? Frag your next section, cover on and hack people up. A much better method than the seven foot single shot pike idea, right? Or it didn't meet the needs of the battlefield. So that's back to us concentrating on the battlefield, right? But the other one is another thing you probably never considered, right? Which is the size of armies. Imagine how many, if you go back and look at the size of the armies we had in the old days, like when we invaded Mexico, right? You can look at the amount of soldiers involved in the battles, and it ends up being like 5,000, including everybody on both sides. Now, if you take forward to our Civil War, those numbers become 30, 40,000 in the big battles, right? Keeping both people, both sides in mind. Now, how about when we got to World War I? How big were the armies then? Because I know you've all heard that trench warfare happened because of technology, because of machine guns, right? But that's not actually true. The real reason, because there was trench warfare in the Civil War. Go to, go to Petersburg and look where the trenches were all around the city, right? Um, so it's not about machine guns. It's about the size of armies. In World War I, the Germans and the French and the British had enough soldiers to defend in death from the border of Switzerland to the ocean. So you could not blame anybody, and that's why we had trench warfare. Huge armies, millions and millions of people. Now, how does that affect us? Well, how many soldiers do you think we had in the United States Army in 1914? I think the number was 115,000. Might have been slightly more. In 1939, it was 125,000. Half of those were in the coastal defense artillery. So how many did we have a few years later, from 1914 to 1918? Or from 1939 to 1945? Millions. I think there was 12 million in our army in 1945. From 125,000, half of which were the coastal defense artillery, to 12 million in six years. Now, think about the logistics of training that force. First off, the average battalion in 1945, the senior person in the battalion had probably been in the Army four or five years, max. You're talking about a battalion or a brigade sergeant major that was a school teacher five years ago, never been in the military, and now they're in that role. Get the idea, right? So what that meant was the skill-based system that the bayonet fixing couldn't survive because they hadn't trained too many people too long or too quickly. At one point in World War I, basic training was done in four weeks. So think about that for a second. You come in off the farm, four weeks of training, off to World War I. Right? That's less than you had at beach, right? So you're going to learn to step off with the left foot, do the manual arm, maybe some marksmanship, off to war. So what they did was they knew they still needed to prepare people mentally, so they still needed head-to-head combat training, but they couldn't do it with skill. So they invented systems that didn't need skill. That's when the bayonet assault course came in. In World War II, they invented the pugil sticks so they could have competitions that didn't require skill. Okay? Now, when did that era last? How long did that era last? We're going to call it the era of mass conscript armies, right? So the American made mass conscript armies for many, many years. And during that time, we did not have a skill-based system. When did that period end? How about the 1970s? The army we fought the Vietnam War with was a mass conscript army. Here's the kind of NCOs you would have had with you in battle had you been a lieutenant in 1967. They used to pick out the best graduates for basic training and send them to another course, which was four weeks long. And they graduated from that course and they came out as staff sergeants and went over on their trip to Vietnam as squad leaders. And that's who you would have had running your squads had you been in that army at that time. Now that is a vastly different circumstance than today's army, right? When you get out there to force now, your squad leaders will have been in six, eight years. Your platoon sergeant will have been in 15 years. You yourself will have more time than anybody in that era because we have much more expanded training, right? 
you get the idea. So it took after the 70s, when we ended that era, 20 more years before we recovered from that no-skill training model we had. And we started the modern model, this one here, that we're doing skill training. Okay? Because now we can do it. We have the time. We have a professional army. Everybody kind of get what I'm talking about. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of lessons as we as we go back to our classrooms and before the test, right? First one, the first one is understand the power of competition. We have two types of competition, right? Formal and informal. What are the informal ones different? Competence across the organization, right? We have good runners across the army because we run all the time. It's an informal competition. If you want to have good fighters, you got to have fighting all the time. There will be, needs to be an informal competition. If you can survive in the Army without ever running, then there will have people who do. And they'll just be crappy runners. If you can survive in the Army without fighting, then there will be people who do. And we will have crappy fighters. It's that simple, right? So informal competition spread confidence across the organization. Formal competition drives towards excellence. Okay? It drives the self motivated towards excellence. What's the downside of comp competition systems, though? Because those are both good sides, right? What's the downside? We get off asthma, right? Competitors are trying, are training to win. Win competition, not fight. Everybody get the idea out of that, right? So we, the leadership, have to be the ones focused on the battlefield. We have to remember that we are the ones responsible for teaching these folks. Now, one more thing I should have mentioned earlier, that'll come up later in this class, which is this. Which portion of this organization do you think is tasked with inculcating the warrior ethos in you guys? Guess what? Is it the EMI? Why not? When you go to the rifle range, is it scary? If it is, maybe you're in the wrong profession. You go out on the land now, of course. Is that scary? Right. So warrior training is training that's scary. In other words, the most important thing you've got to do on the battlefield is overcome your fears and execute your training. Where do you have to do that in this organization? Yeah, you can right? That's the thread that connects all of our classes we hadn't thought about before. What's the scariest thing we have going on here? In this whole institution, what do you think is the scariest thing? The place where we put people under the most pressure to face their fears? I think it's swimming. <laughs> you know, imagine that you're a non-swimmer and you show up here and you've got to go through the survival games, right? Jump off that platform. I don't know about you guys, but that shit seems like the most terrifying thing we have. And I'm telling you that because I want you to appreciate that that's where we're putting those people. You know what I mean? If you're making fun of them for not being able to swim, you're in the wrong boat. You should be looking at them going, holy shit, they have to overcome that. I'm glad that I can swim so I didn't have to overcome that. It was so much easier for me. You get the idea, right? Okay? That's the thread that brings DP together, isn't it? When you're in the boxing ring, when you're going off that platform, when you're in here fighting, training is scary. You have to overcome your fears and execute the training that you've been receiving. And that's what you have to do on the battlefield too, right? Imagine what it's going to be like when your platoon has just taken six casualties. You got two dead people. You got the medics working on three or four more. And your mission hasn't gone away. You still got to accomplish it, right? In a fight, there's no quitting. Right? Come on. Think about this in the rest of your career, right? When you're out on the run, and that person in the back of the run is doing this thing, you know? What are they really trying to accomplish there? What they're trying to accomplish is to make you feel sorry for them. If you can feel sorry for them, maybe you won't feel so bad, won't be so down on them. That's what they're trying to accomplish. Now imagine that person in the boxing room. What happens when you start making that face in the boxing room? Yeah, the enemy, your opponent feeds off of it, makes them stronger, and then they beat you down. 
What happens when you do that in a bad kid? Nobody feels sorry for you like that. Nobody in the world, in a war zone, feels sorry for you. Right? They don't. And we have to be the ones who know that. We have to be the ones. What do leaders do, right? Leaders provide purpose, direction, and motivation. You know what that means? We provide the motivation. What percentage of your platoon or of your peers are self-motivated to be fighters? So the good news is we don't have to be self-motivated in the Army because we have leaders who provide the motivation. That's your job, right? We provide the motivation. So, informal competitions provide competence across organizations. Formal competitions provide excellence, right? The problem with formal competitions is they pull us off out. Okay? Note that without competitions, we didn't have a combatants program. We had it on paper. When I came in the Army, you know what we did? Combatants? Not the basic. We did four hours or something of it in basic training. Never did it again. The things we did were unrealistic. Everybody used to joke about how it's just teaching you enough to get you beat up. That started changing when we started be teaching people this because now we taught you enough to go choke people out. Now we gotta worry about you guys going out to choke people out because you know how to do it. That's a better problem to have as a leader of the army, I'm telling you right now. Okay. That cover everything? Okay. Why don't people train? Ah, good point. So, what are the things we hear about why people don't like combatants? Just think about your peer group, right? The people out here, the people who don't want to be here, people who don't want to take their scars, wish they didn't have to, don't like to do combatants. If you bring it up in your formation that you want to do combatants training this next time we're all getting together for training, those people, what do they say? First thing they say is it causes injuries, right? We hear that one a lot. So, what do you think has the least amount of injuries of everything that goes on in this building? It's swimming. Right? <laughs> what do you think is second? Combatants. We are safer than handball. Way safer than handball. We're safer than flicker ball. We're safer than soccer. We're sa way safer than flag football. What do you suppose was the number one physical activity that sent soldiers home with orthopedic injuries from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? It was basketball. All right, it was basketball. Guess what was number two? Running, which is kind of amazing considering some of the thoughts people were on like as big as this room. Everybody had a serious dedicated runner, like back and forth, back and forth, right? Running is the number one injury producer in the Army. Okay? Basketball is a close set. So if it was really about danger of injury, they'd be on the crusade against basketball, wouldn't it? But they're not, because that's not actually what it's about. So what is it about? Human beings have two primary fears, right? The biggest one is fear of death. The second one is fear of loss of status. In other words, public humiliation. So consider, why are people afraid of public speaking? Is it because they might break their leg? That isn't it, right? They're afraid they're gonna get up there and humiliate themselves and lose staff. That's why they're afraid to do it. Okay. Of note, you ever meet an old soldier that was afraid of public speaking? No. Guess why not? But you have to do it all the time. If you do it all the time, you lose your fear of it. Okay? So, with that being said, why are people afraid of combatants? Same reason. What they're afraid of is they're going to get out and get humiliated. Okay? So, we have to know that. We have to know that because when you have that person who's trying to avoid it, you've got to understand what they're about. And we have to have things in place to overcome that, right? Remember I told you earlier about General Milley making the gay commanders and starting to to fight in front of the corps, right? How do you think he did that? You think he came out and said, hey, you're fighting tomorrow. 
Right here, man. I don't know how he did it all. This, he said, you're fighting three mocks. Start training. You're going to be on display. You think any of those brigade commanders, who after all were in the late 40s and 50s, right? You think any of them went out there and humiliated themselves? Because that's not how it works, right? They didn't humiliate themselves. What do your soldiers expect of you? On the run, what do they expect of you? They expect you to be the fastest runner in your platoon? No, of course not, right? Do they expect you to be the best fighter in your platoon? Of course not. That means if you lose, it's no big deal. What is a big deal then? Avoiding it, avoiding fighting, it's a big deal because they can see right through you, man. They can see your soul. They know what you're about. If you're avoiding the fighting, they know why. Or if you get out there fighting and you look like you're terrible, as in you don't have a warrior spirit, they can see that too. But all they really expect of you is to have that warrior spirit. I've been teaching this about fourth year, right? So, so at the end of this year, I'll have seen about 5,000 of you guys come through here and fight on these maps, right? Guess how many of those 5,000 have humiliated themselves? Not one. Not a single one. Because it's really hard to humiliate yourself. You really just have to come hard. And everybody does. And why does everybody do that? Because we demand it. And I don't mean me. And I don't mean those guys. I mean we demand it. They're performing for you. You're performing for each other. And that's what it means to have a warrior culture. That's actually what it means. That we push each other to do the right thing. Right? And the right thing in this organization means the thing that it's going to keep our soldiers alive. And who are you really leading, you know? You hear this all the time, it's true. Remember those kids that you joined, that you were in high school with, who joined the service? Remember those kids? I want you to picture one of them, right? Picture two of them. You can probably come up with their names off the top of your head, but you can definitely come up with their faces. Think about that person. Is that the people that you would imagine as the warriors? If there were people on the other side of this post who wanted to kill us, and you said, I need a couple of people to come with me, would you pick them? Yeah, but that's who you got. <laughs> right? And guess whose job it is to turn them into warriors? Your job. Our job, right? And you know what's the great thing about this institution? Right now, you're being graded on your own individual efforts, right? When you go to chemistry class later today, you'll learn how to burn people alive with chemicals. You're going to be graded on your knowledge of chemicals, right? Guess when that stops? On graduation day. After that, you never get graded again on what you can individually do. Never again. That's over. Being a leader means you're about your unit. Your performance isn't anything. Your unit's performance is everything. It doesn't matter if you're the best fighter in the whole student body. If your platoon can't fight, it was for naught. Everybody get the idea, right? So, combatives competition are the best tool we have to inculcate the warrior ethos in those kids you went to high school with. The kids that you're leading to battle. When you and your side of the platoon are moving around the battlefield, and like I said, that lead vehicle gets blown off the face of the map, the rear vehicle gets hemmed in, and those guys are up there burning alive, and you guys come out the vehicle and start taking down buildings, and you're all provisional infantrymen at that point. Well, you've done right by it? How much time do you have, Craig? You got time? You're there. You got, we're there at this? I got one more thing. For you? You got it. How about this, right? When was the last time you think a bunch of U.S. soldiers entered a building where they could go in and kill everybody in the building? Probably a long time ago, right? If we can kill everybody in the building, we're going to send cruise missiles. Okay? Why do we send soldiers? We send soldiers because we can't kill everybody in the building. Right? So that commander 
was afraid to come out of training, and that's why their unit doesn't do it, because of their personal performance anxiety, right? They're sending their soldiers in there without the skill. Because if you can't shoot everybody in the building, that means you're going to be manhandling people in the building, right? And if you haven't trained your people how to do that, you send them there like a car burner with a hammer, right? Every problem becomes a van. You send them in that problem with life. You have a rifle, it sure is easy to have every problem look like a target, right? And when they shoot those people, it is your fault. It is your fault because you failed to make the moral decision to stand up to your own fears and train your soldiers the way they need to be trained. And that's a real problem, right? All right. So with that being said, if you guys are going to fall back to your classroom, 